Look at my dorky ass waking up after fireworks festival. God, yeah, we gotta change. I have like a sparkler in hand. Uncanny. <laughs> I gotta make my ass look like a wedding coordinator, you know what I mean? Like, I gotta look like I'm like on, on, the, on the mission. I gotta look like I'm on top of this, you know, like a wedding planner. That's the word I was looking for, for sure. The wedding planner, that's me, you know? So let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and look the part. Let's see, it's gotta be like business cash, you know what I mean? Business cash. Let's take the accessories off first, how about? Like amazing, Amanda, really. Yeah, not very professional. Oh, a Dratini cap, where did I get this? How cute is that? But that's not very professional. What's something like a wedding planner would wear? You know what I mean? Something like this shit, basically. But I don't like it. Or like this, no, nah, maybe this. You know, that's something like a wedding planner would wear, maybe. Definitely one of these. Oh yeah, that's wedding planner shit for sure. Where's like the nice one? I, you know, like that that pinkish one. I probably gave it to someone because I'm such a good friend. <laughs> yeah, this is too like black and white. I think this, or maybe I have a um, maybe I have a custom code thing. Wow, that's the only dress I have. I really am slacking on the custom codes. Let's see here. No, it's gonna be like a dress thing. That's kind of wedding plannery, kind of, a little bit. No, like very formal. Oh, that's kind of, eh, not really actually. This is all for winter, baby girl. It is August, okay? Cozy goth, I love that. Winter collection, why do you keep doing this? Winter collection, yet again. But like, we can't wait till winter though, right? And fall, she's gonna be decked out. She's gonna be decked out then. <laughs> Just not right now. How cute is that? That's kind of wedding plannery, but like in August, Maybe, perhaps. Ooh, that's cute. You know what, that might be doing it for me. A little bit. With like this, maybe? It's kind of doing it for me. Ooh, these booties, hello. Maybe not the black though, maybe these ones. Ooh, wedding planner on the scene and the maid of honor too. Yeah, I just do everything around here. Yeah, I think they should be these. No, 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 no. Yes. Wait, are these better or? These, yeah, these. And then like some kind of a, oh, glasses for sure. Yeah, these glasses, hello. And then what hat? What's like a wedding planner hat? Ooh, maybe, possibly. Oh, oh, is she planning a wedding or or what? <laughs> Could be, no, 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 nah, it's too much. Don't wanna take away attention from the bride. You know, if Pom Pom had it her way, we'd all be wearing these. So we don't take away any attention. What it, What is this? Stage hand hat. Okay, so they don't see you or whatever when you're like, I was just like, what the fuck is that actually? <laughs> I never asked questions about that and I should have long ago. Oh, that's kind of cute for a wedding planner or something. You know what? This might just do it. Yeah, I'm not gonna think too much about it. Wait, where's my glasses? Should I wear the glasses? I thought I had glasses on, what happened? Didn't I choose glasses? Is that too much? No, not at all. Not enough, actually. Yeah, she's like ready to plan the wedding. Yeah, now I gotta get shit out for the wedding because we're doing it. And like the planning's over. I keep saying planning, but now we're just setting up at this point, which is so exciting because it's right around the corner. It is this weekend. Oh, all my little spoils from the fireworks festival. Now I get to actually have like all these wedding favors to put out for people when you guys come down. Yep, the wedding uh, party for the pay for the um, for the patrons is this weekend, and then we'll probably have the wedding video out for everybody next weekend. So, yeah, we are really fixing to have a blast out here. Uh, it's gonna be like a weekend long reception, so that'll be fun. What am I doing? No, this is not. No, that's not what we were doing. Server maintenance. In an hour? So I can't play? Is that what? <laughs> Was that just telling me I have like an hour to get this shit done? <laughs> Cause it's not gonna happen. No, we're not favoriting this. We're putting it away. Oh, do I still have it in my hand or so? Oh, of course, and I can't like put it away. Cause I'm, all right, uh, what is this? Oh, I can't put that away. Let me just get this out of my hand real quick. It's 
probably wasting my time, but whatever. Yeah, put that shit away, you dumb bitch. And you know what? I ought to, because I'm going to have a lot of stuff I need to get. So I ought, I ought to just put this sign back when I took it out away needlessly and never put it back in the last video. Yeah, I need to remember to do shit like that. Okay. Love the rock right in my fucking way. Love that. The teacups up there, did you see them? They were just going crazy. It makes me happy to see that. <laughs> I think that whole area is still gay as fuck. I love it. I had I was in no rush to clean up after Pride. Pride is every day, all day. But I am probably gonna make it into like more of a wedding area. Temporarily, of course. But yeah, we are doing uh, you know, the the typical basic ass pink. That's what Palm wanted. I would have picked the green, but that's it's her wedding. Um, so yeah, that is her thing, and I Love it for her. The whole island is celebrating. And we are so thrilled to do this. I'm probably gonna run out of room real quick. Why am I so concerned about running out of room? Let's just like drop these for now. We're gonna have so much live music. <laughs> oh, do I have, I don't have like a white one, it's fine. So much live music everywhere. Everywhere you go is live music, just beautiful. So many flowers. Flowers fucking everywhere. Ugh, pockets are full already. Let's just put this shit out on the lawn because like we are gonna need all of it, okay? Like all of it. When I tell you that this island is not gonna be, it's gonna be a huge effort to clean up. Let's just say that, okay? But like whatever, drop, drop. Yeah, so I'm gonna get all this shit out. And then when we set, while we set up, I'll do some questions. It'll be, you know, just like old times, me just spouting off about random shit, you know? All right, so uh, first question popping out at me. So Charles asked, out of curiosity, have you ever played any of the Sims games? I think you would enjoy it, or at least the older games. Sims 4 is a mess. I'm so glad you brought this up because I've been really wanting to talk to you guys about this. Um, so I haven't, I don't know if I've ever talked about <laughs> my relationship with the Sims, but I love the Sims, okay? I absolutely love the Sims. I love it so much as a very unpopular kid with not a lot of friends growing up. The Sims was everything to me. Like I really not only looked forward to coming home from school to like escape the torment of my adversaries. And also school was just like so hard for me as somebody who had undiagnosed ADHD for like so long. Um, but also my Sims were always there waiting for me and they did whatever the fuck I told them to do for the most part. So I love that. <laughs> and you know me, I was always all up in the drama. I just loved having relationships with multiple Sims. Uh, I, you know what? I was never the type of person that killed my Sims. I was good to my Sims. I didn't want my Sims to die. If my Sims died, it was a, f it was a complete accident. Everybody's always like, I love killing my Sims. I'm like, get help. You are entrusted to care for them. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to give them a good life. And boy, did I give my Sims a good life because, you know, I had those cheat codes, baby. I never worked a day in my damn life. <laughs> for a long time, that's the only, it's the only place I felt I had any power in this world. <laughs> so I'm, I'm old. So I did play like the Sims 1. But my favorite game, and I played The Sims 1, 2, and 3. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today because I haven't played The Sims 4 yet, ever. Um, and I don't know like if it's like this with you guys. It probably is. I think I've heard people talk about this. But I go through phases where like I am obsessed with The Sims and I play it all the time. And then I get so burned out on it that I don't play it for years, right? And that's kind of what happened here. And it's been like the longest stretch that I've ever not played The Sims. It also like I'm, it's one of those games I'm scared of because it takes up my entire life. And like, I'm afraid that it's gonna take over my life if I start playing it again. Um, even though like every other game that I pick up, Stardew Valley, freaking Pokemon, uh, Story of Seasons, they always take over my life too, it's fine. But like, if you get it, you get The Sims takes over your life in a, in a different way. You know, you can really sink like eight hours a day into The Sims, <laughs> like kind of, you know? And, uh, but I am starting to feel like I wanna play The Sims again. And I've heard nothing but bad things about The Sims 4, even though I keep seeing things and it looks not that bad, or I just want to play it. I don't know. So like, tell me if it's that bad um, and maybe I'll play it. But also like I've, so I played the first three games and I would say out of all of them, maybe it's just a nostalgia thing for me. I definitely did play a lot of The Sims 3 and it's like a beautiful game. But The Sims 2, come on, like, can you beat it? I don't think you can. The Sims 2, 
like I guess I maybe it was just it, it coming out after The Sims 1 which like to be fair was awesome and I played a lot of the other Sims games too like I played the GameCube Sims game what was that like The Sims busting out oh my god do you remember that that game was so fucking weird that game was a fever dream that game was a fever dream like they wow yeah, it really was. There was just so much. And then you had a car, but you couldn't actually drive. You could drive. I don't know. You could go visit people. And that was different. What a weird game. I'm sorry. <laughs> just thinking about it. It's just what a weird game. Uh, yeah. But then The Sims 2 was kind of a fever dream, too. You get there and they're like, yeah, Bella Goth is missing. And I'm like, cool, let's find her. You don't ever find her, by the way. Did we ever end up finding Bella Goth? I don't think we did. She just went missing. And like, I think, did Mortimer kill her? I don't know. But we don't know where Bella Goth is. And I loved that as a kid. I was like, ooh, she's missing? Like as in like a true crime case? What? And then like they, they always had aliens, but like <laughs> you get there in The Sims 2 and it's just like a whole family of aliens. Oh my God, I love that guy, Johnny. What was his last name? Johnny something? Johnny Smith. Yeah, because their last name was Smith, because it was, like, <laughs> normal. Even though the dad was, like, fucking drone E4X2. What was his name? You know the dad? <laughs> I love that fucking game. And they just try to play it off like it's nothing. But Johnny was cute. Johnny was a cute alien hybrid boy, wasn't he? I like Johnny. And he was dating that girl. Was her name Ophelia? I'm like, this is all fucking, like, distant memories. Or she lived in... The she lived in the house where her mom killed everybody or something, right? Or her grandma. Didn't she live in that family that they had all those graves and shit? If you know, you know. I'm just spouting off like random Sims shit. But uh, The Sims is awesome. What else is... is um, oh, and then they had the whole Veronaville. Is that what it was called? And it was all Romeo and Juliet. And that's how I knew everything about Romeo and Juliet when I went into high school. We started fucking... And I was like, oh yeah, the caps. Oh, the Capulets. That's what I meant. <laughs> And like I knew all their names and shit because uh, the whole Veronaville was all the plot of Romeo and Juliet. That was great. And then, uh, oh my God. And they had that one family that was like experimenting on that person. They had like a person captive in their basement and shit. Was experimenting on them. I was a child, Sims. What the fuck? Yeah, what a game. And they like trusted us to play it. Like my mom didn't realize she was buying me. I do have this one distinct memory where... Um, so I was at GameStop and my mom was gonna buy me a game. I must have done something, right? Maybe I got A's or something. Like she was gonna buy me a game and I wanted her to buy me The Sims 2 Nightlife. And I was so close. She was gonna buy it for me. I wanted it so bad. Like you could go out on the town and stuff. And then she like read the back. And I gotta find like what the back said because she was like, you are not getting this. Oh my God. This is an inappropriate expansion pack. Like, you need to pick another one. And so that's when I got, I got the vacation one instead. I was like, Ugh. but I was begging her. I was like, please. And I wanted so badly to tell her, like, if only you knew, like, my Sims are, <laughs> like, I have learned a lot of stuff that you probably didn't want me to know about from the Sims, okay? If only you fucking knew. But I couldn't say anything because then she would take my whole game away. So I was just like, fine, I won't get nightlife. And I had to get fucking the Sims break vacation instead, which sucked. Actually, it didn't suck. You could go like, it was kind of it was kind of boring, but you could go to like a snowy area. You could go to like, um, I just loved the expansion packs. Like, but I was I never was happy in the Sims until the pets one came out. Until I got the pets, could never be happy in the Sims until I had pets ever. And then I loved how whenever you got the like expand expansion packs, they like added on like new people and stuff. It was great. <sighs> The Sims. I want to play it again so bad. I love The Sims. I just, I, I don't know. I just keep hearing that The Sims 4 is like so bad. And I'm like, like bad enough where I'm going to like regret my life if I get it, you know? Like, is it that bad? I don't think it is. Anyway, um, I love The Sims. Absolutely love it. I played the first game. I play The Sims busting out. <laughs> I played The Herbs. You remember it was on the DS or something? And you're in the city. I played that one. I played, obviously, The Sims 3. I played The Sims, like, there was, like, a GameCube game for just The Sims one. I played that one, too. Oh, my God. And then my cousin had The Sims Online. It was, like, the first one, and I fucking loved it. And I was, like, always begging him to play it. But you needed, like, real money to even have fun on it. But whatever. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm just a big Sims fangirl. But I will admit, I have not kept up with the with the lore 
You know, I don't know if we ever found Bella. Did we ever find Bella Goth? Did Mortimer do it? Or like, am I just blaming the husband because it's most likely him statistically? Do we know what happened to her? Is there theories? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, and who were those like rich people? Like who owned the town? Uh, Longbottom or something? What was his name? It was like Longbottom. What the fuck was his name? But it wasn't Longbottom. Langford? No. You all know what I'm talking about. His, he was, he always wore like a top hat and shit. What the fuck? And his, he had a daughter, Mimi. And you had to play as her in The Sims Bustin' Out, I think. Right? <laughs> what was his name? Malcolm. Malcolm uh, Langford. Now I gotta look it up. The Sims. Malcolm. Land grab. Oh, land grab. Ooh, because he's a fucking billionaire. Land grab. Yeah, I hate the land grab family. Eat the rich, am I right? Yeah. Anyway, love The Sims. Let me know if you'd ever want me to play it because I would totally play it. I just keep hearing that The Sims 4 sucks. Are they going to do like a Sims 5? Are they going to make it better? Does anybody know? Anyway, next question. Oh, this is a good one from Julia. How do you feel about psychics, mediums, etc.? Stuff like that. That's a great question. So pretty much like everything in that vein, I I hope it's real. I want it to be real. I think that's such a cool concept that like some people can like to communicate with the dead or can like tell the future or like they can, I don't know that they have these like clairvoyant powers. And I am that type of person that doesn't like necessarily believe in it, but I buy into it really quick because I so want to suspend my disbelief at any turn. So I will do that. Um, like when I watch like, was, and again, I don't know anything deep about this stuff. Okay. So if I say something like, like if I'm about to stand someone who's like a known piece of shit, like just let me know in the comments. I'm not like doing it on purpose, but like I, I've, and I, and I, for like, just so we're straight, I, I don't actually like stand these people, I like, if I bring up anybody by name, it's like, cause I saw them on TV one time. So like the Long Island medium, is that her name? I've seen her on TV a couple times, right? And like, I'll sit there, I'll get swept up in it. You know, when I see it, I don't have cable. So it's ever like, I'll be like at my in-laws house or something. I think one time my mom was watching it <laughs> and like, I'll just start watching it. And I totally get swept up in her. Like she seems so genuine and like these people who she's, and I know it's TV and it's probably all fake. But like, even when I watch other mediums, like on, you know, just like little clips and stuff, I don't like go out of my way to watch mediums. But like, I think most of us have seen stuff with mediums, right? And like, when I see stuff with mediums, it seems like they're, first of all, it seems they're very good at it. They're very believable. And then the people who they're like doing it for, they seem like they're really getting something out of it. Like they're like so happy. It gives them like so much comfort and peace. You know what I mean? And so like in that sense, I'm like, wow, like that seems like a good thing, even if it's not real, <laughs> honestly. Like, I don't know. I could be totally talking out of my ass right now, but like it seems nice. Like it seems like it gives people closure to like just kind of sit there and believe that this person is talking to like their deceased loved ones and like is getting the notion that like they are at peace and like they're watching over them because it's obviously like a really scary, horrifying idea to like lose someone and then feel like you're never gonna get to see them or talk to them ever again and that they're just gone. That's something that, you know, haunts many people. And it's just a really horrifying thing to even like fathom. So I know that that can probably give a lot of people a lot of, um, a lot of peace, which is nice. But like, if they're like, charging like a lot of money for that, which I know they have to make a living, but like that's where it gets kind of weird, obviously, where it's like, hmm, like, are they just, but then you see them on the shows and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I have to stop you because like the spirits are telling me to talk to you, you know, that kind of shit. So it's like, how do they know? But like, is that stuff all orchestrated? So obviously I don't know. I'm based on my belief systems, which are all founded in sciences. Obviously, that would imply that I, do, I don't subscribe to beliefs in things like that as much as I would love to. Because as someone who is like such a, I don't know, like just scientific, like not fun person, as I like to call myself, when my closest loved ones die, I'm going to be up over that and I would maybe 
feel a lot of comfort in being like, oh, you, you talk to them? Really? That's awesome. Like, good to hear. I don't know, you know? So, like, that's really cool. But obviously, there's been, like, a lot of um, psychics and mediums who have been known to, like, be scam artists and to be, like, you know, scamming people out of their money because they're grieving and they're really vulnerable, which sucks. Like, I watched this whole thing about Harry Houdini. What a fucking champ that guy was. I loved him, I think. He was cool, right? I think he was a cool guy. He wasn't problematic, was he? I think he was cool. Because if I remember correctly, he was, like, the type of magician that, like, he was my guy. Because not only was he a magician, and y'all know how I feel about a magician, right? But he was like, yo, this isn't magic. Like, I'm just that talented that I'm making y'all think that I'm magic. But this isn't magic. He was, like, so upfront about it. But the thing about him was he never, I don't think, if I have this correct, I don't think he ever, like, let people know how he did stuff. But he would, like, assure you that it was not magic. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to show you how I did it. But, like, I assure you that I did it. And it wasn't, like, a magic thing. And he was, like, super against mediums and stuff. Like, he was, like, really, I don't know, he was, like, against it. Because he felt like it was exploitative and, like, it was fake. He knew that he he was not doing magic, you know, and so he, um, I think he had had some trouble. If I, if I remember this correctly, he had had like some problems with, with processing grief. And I think he went to a medium and he got like super fucking upset when he found out that it wasn't real. And he felt like really exploited, which is like understandable. And so he like was, had this vendetta against mediums and psychics and stuff. And he had if, I don't know if it was him or someone else, but like he had like a, maybe it was someone else, but someone, and I know this is still a thing, like they have like a million dollar reward to anyone who can prove that like they're doing magic or like that they're doing something like clairvoyant. You know what I mean? Like if they can prove it, then they get a million bucks and like nobody's claimed that yet, which is like a little weird. But then like, I don't know, anytime I've ever... I've never like had like a full like psychic ass reading like where you're like, you know, a psychic is like telling you stuff, but like I've had like some tarot card readings and like stuff like that. And the tarot card readings that I've had have been so fucking spot on. It is not even funny. It's actually fucking crazy. Like there are, is no way that they could have known shit like this, you know? No way at all. There's just no way. And like, I don't know, it's just crazy. Like there was a couple months ago, um, my friend Libby, shout out to you, came to visit me and we hung out and um, they did a tarot card reading and they were saying something. No, oh my God, Libby was shuffling the fucking cards, right? And then they pulled a card and they were like, oh, I think that the cards are talking to you. And I was like, Libby, shut up, what? I was like, oh, here we go with this shit. Like, oh my God, that's so cool. They're like, oh, the cards are talking to you. And they were like, I don't know. I just, I get the feeling that they, this is a message for you. And I was like, okay, let's see what it says. Like, all right. Cause like Libby had been spot on the whole time, but I'd never had like the cards are talking to you before, right? So she does this reading and it's like, she, she said that like the cards were saying that like I was gonna get recognition at work and I'd been working really hard at work and like I felt really burnt out and like it just kind of had gone unnoticed or blah, blah, blah. And that I was about to get like something for all that. Not that I ever work for those things, but like that's what the card said. And I was just like, huh, okay. Cause like I couldn't see it. I couldn't really see that happening to be honest. Like not that I like, I love my job and like where I work, but I was like, you know, I just did what I had to do. Like that was my role. And basically I think I talked about a little bit during the pandemic. I was just really miserable and like really had a lot put on me because like we couldn't have any of our volunteers in. And so I was doing a lot of like really hard work, like all by myself. And it was just like taking a lot out of me. And I just felt like really overwhelmed by that for like a really long time. So I was just like, oh, well, that's good to know. I mean, I've definitely been feeling that way at work, but like, I doubt like anything's gonna happen. And literally, this is not a lie. You guys know I don't lie. And like, I want the answers, I want the truth. So I would never like stretch the truth because I want the truth, if that makes any sense anyway. So I get to work and that day, my boss like gave me a big hug and was like, I just want you to know how much we truly like appreciate everything that you had done for us. Like we couldn't have gotten through this with you and we're giving you a raise. Like, <laughs> I swear to God, it was this, the day I got back to work that that happened. And the cards were speaking to me and wanted me to know that. I'm just saying. So like that is something that's like, I just don't understand how that works. I just quite can literally do not understand and have no answers for you <laughs> regarding those types of things. Um, but on the other hand, like I've heard, you know, just a lot of like weird, sketchy 
stories about like psychics and mediums. Like I always like I'm really into true crime. And sometimes there are psychics that like know what the fuck is going on, that they have like r accurate like pr predictions. But then there's like a lot of psychics that fuck shit up and like don't know what they're talking about. And like they'll say like ridiculous things and it like really upsets the family. And it like it's just kind of like not like necessary and it's like kind of harmful because they'll like insert their opinions and then and then it just kind of like muddies the case and it's like well, what what like you know what I mean like I don't know how to describe it but it's definitely one of those things where like maybe it's real but like maybe not everybody who claims to be a psychic or a medium is one there are definitely people out there who are like saying that they're doing this stuff and they're not so my thought on it now would be that like if it is a real thing there's a lot of people out there who are just like straight up ruining it for like the rest of the world if that makes sense and maybe they're the ones who make it so that like people don't believe in it because they're the ones who are out there like scamming people and like taking advantage of people and exploiting people if that makes sense so yeah that's kind of my thoughts on that i am always open to stuff like that though like if i ever have the chance to get like a full psychic reading or like speak to a medium or something i would love to know what they're gonna say you know i would just it's just like for science for me like i would love to know how how close they get you know and, and if they get close i'm always like how did they do it you know so yeah i don't know let me know what you guys think and if you have any like resources or any um experiences with that kind of stuff because that stuff can be really cool or it can be really like exploitative and harmful it just depends on who's doing it i guess and that's kind of like my opinion on it right now it's like maybe like i would love to believe that some people are genuinely like out there like able to do this stuff and like it's real and then other people might be out there like ruining it for the rest of us and like being shitty you know maybe and that's kind of like the case with like everything honestly isn't it so yeah i don't know okay um the lovely Allison really wants to do this right now. <laughs> and you know I'm going to. She asked, Hi, Amanda. I was wondering if you could tell us about bats. Like, just go on a tangent about them. That's what she said. They're my favorite animal. Oh, I can do that. You know I can do that. And I will. I, I, I love bats, as you know. Wow, where do I even start? So bats are just such incredible creatures that I, you know, there's a lot of animals that I, I on a daily basis, like, just kind of can't believe they are real and exist on this planet and bats are one of them for sure bats are gosh again where do i even start like there's just once you once you get into bats you just lose yourself you know as i am about to in front of everyone but i guess that's a good thing so bats are the only mammals that can fly and i know that um you know there's like flying squirrels and other mammals that can uh, can quote unquote fly but they are they're technically gliding whereas bats are the only mammals that are capable of like suspended flight and have these beautiful wings. In fact, even the name of the order that bats are in, Chiroptera, means hand wing, which is perfect because it describes their amazing structure that is one of my favorite examples of convergent evolution in the world. <laughs> like I'm really about to get so nerdy, but you know, I won't linger on it too long. Obviously evolution, is a very real thing. It's kind of amazing that, I mean, I'm not trying to attack anybody's beliefs, but there is so much proof all around us for, for evolution. It's just something that's completely not like debatable at all. Um, you know, believe whatever you want, but evolution is completely proven. It's something that I studied immensely. You can see it. There are so many really cool examples that are unshakable. And one of them, I mean, this isn't like the most like hit you in the face example. I can think of so many cool like vestigial structures out there that are better. But just if you look at the structure of a bat's wing, it's obviously been tailored to this amazing function, but the form of it is very mammalian and they have finger bones. Whereas if you look at the structure of an insect's wing or of a bird's wing, it might have some homology, um, especially with the bird wing, but you just see the amazing work of evolution where these were mammals that were getting around like other mammals and then slowly but surely their uh, form changed over millions of years to serve a very specific function and you can again see that so so well in bats and in their skeleton still to this day and that's such a cool thing it's just amazing that these things are like living among us these uh 
these, it's not like a fossil that shows us evolution. It's actually something that's alive and, and using something that still has this pathway of how it got there still to this day. Like, I know this isn't about evolution, but it's something I'm very passionate about because it's just such a cool, cool thing. It's amazing and it's all around us. And so anyway, back to bats. <laughs> I just love talking about science and it's something that you know, I'm, I'm just happy that people want to hear about because I could talk all day about it. But gosh, bats are awesome. And because um, species are always changing and being reclassified, I think last time I heard there was somewhere between 900 and uh, 1,100 species of bats. There's micro bats and micro bats are uh, generally going to be a lot smaller than their counterparts, the mega bats. But there are some species of mega bats that are pretty small. Um, but micro bats are generally going to be nocturnal. They're going to be uh, the ones that you are familiar with hearing about having echolocation capabilities. They um, hunt at night and micro bats that <laughs> eat bugs can, because um, there are a lot of microbat species that don't just eat bugs, and there's some microbat species that eat blood, which is really cool. And the cool thing about insectivorous microbats, not all of them, but many species of them, they're out all night hunting, and they can eat up to 1,200 bugs in an hour. Not in a night, but in an hour, which is pretty remarkable. And, uh, and so they are so important. Both micro and mega bats are so important. The bats that eat bugs obviously play a major, major role in keeping the populations of bugs down. So without bats, we would definitely notice that they weren't here anymore. And then uh, mega bats, they are uh, incredibly important pollinators and they disperse seeds through their droppings and they pollinate um, different plants, not only the frugivorous ones, but ones that eat nectar as well. They're big pollinators too, so we need them. Um, let's see, what else is there about bats? Oh, bats are so cute. Their babies are called pups, and ba many bats only have one pup at a time, and if they have two, then it's twins. It's not even like a litter, but they often only have one baby at a time, and they are pretty slow to reproduce. Uh, they're long-lived too. They can live up to 30 years, and for like a a relatively small mammal, that's like an incredibly long lifespan because you consider something that is similar in size like a rat or a mouse that only lives two years, you know, and then they can live like 30 years. They have really, really complex dynamics with, um, with other bats in caves and things like that. And they have different communication techniques and they love to chatter with each other. They're so fucking cute. Holy shit. Have you ever actually seen a bat? The first time I ever saw like a little brown bat, I've, um, I've, I'm sadly not gotten to work with bats like at all, but I've gotten to see them. Like I've known, I have like a lot of animal friends. And so I've gotten to like go see them a couple of times. And the first time I ever saw like a little brown bat, because those guys like, obviously, you know, I love fruit bats. They're so cute. And they're just so like, out, you know, you see them and they're obviously adorable. But like for the micro bats, you really got to look closely at them. But, um, you know, one of my friends who's like a rehabber had like a little brown bat and uh, she had her in her hand and she just opened her hand. Oh my God, I could fucking punch my computer and break it right now because I'm, I'm having cute rage so bad. I'm sorry. Like I'm just, I might actually break something thinking about, oh my God, I should probably just explain it. The little bat and she looks up and she just starts going and like chattering to me. Oh my God, it was like an angel on this earth. I, I started feeling weeping. I was like, oh, how can I help her? Oh my God, I wanted to bring her like gifts and lay them at her feet. And I just like couldn't believe how fucking cute this little thing was. And she had the audacity to look up at me, this like giant, and just start like talking shit or something. I don't know. She just like was chattering to me and she was so fucking precious. And I don't think that a lot of people like look at bats closely or something because like, I don't know that people know how cute they are. I think, I think people don't know. I think people have no fucking clue how cute bats are. I really think that, um, but they are actually so adorable that it is not fair. Again, they're like I was saying, I got kind of lost on a tangent, but they're really slow to reproduce. 
and they are declining, a lot of them, especially microbats, but megabats as well. They are, in the United States, I know for sure, over 50% of all bat species are in decline and facing extinction. And that's because of the white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease that spreads really, really rapidly. Because as animals that go to a hibernaculum and co-hibernate as closely as they do, um, you know, they spread it just like so easily. It's so sad. And so they're really struggling. But thankfully, they've been working really hard because obviously bats, again, are such an important animal. And every animal is so important. But I always say, like, even if animals aren't important necessarily, they still matter and they sh should still be protected. It always upsets me whenever like I'm out like doing outreach and education. I always have people, and they're always older people. I'm not no nothing against older people, but this is just always I don't know. I think our generations were taught better. And there's again, there's plenty of older people who get it. I work for older people, and I the, my, all of my mentors and my heroes were older people. So I, I but I guess there's always like an older person who's like you know I'll be I'll have like this whole booth up and it'll be like save the frogs and like all this information about frogs and then there'll be this like person who's like but why like why should we like what do they do what's important about frogs like what what are they good for like literally they ask like what are they good for and then I get to tell them like oh well you know frogs are obviously really important parts of like every ecosystem that they inhabit and they do this, 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 and this. And without them, you know, you would have a lot more bugs and a lot more this and a lot more that. And then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's pretty important. But like, they have to like ask why an animal deserves to exist. And that always rubs me the wrong way. But bats are obviously really important. And so, um, you know, for better or worse, that impacts funding. And there has been, thankfully, a lot of funding, even though they're not as cute and lovable and not as many people rush to donate to them as like something cuter, like pandas and dolphins and stuff. But um, there's been a lot of government funding, at least here in the United States, for saving bats and doing research on, on white nose fungus. And so even though things are still really bad and the bats really still need our help, there's definitely been a lot of strides being made. And so hopefully we'll be able to combat white nose fungus because it's really, really scary. But they're just amazing animals. I just love them so much. I just love big fruit bats and little tiny micro bats. And there's so many, they're just so, like there's over a thousand species of them. So they're so diverse. There's so many beautiful types. I love a fucking ugly ass bat. And I mean that in the most loving way possible. Like when I say ugly, I mean my son, the cutest Ooh, I'm getting mad again. Somebody calm me down. I have a bat poster that most of you have seen. <laughs> I'm like looking at it right now at all the ugly ass bats that I love so much. And again, they are not ugly to me or in general, like as a fact, not ugly. But like people would maybe think that they're not the cutest bats because there's like the really fucking cute bats out there. Like all the flying foxes and the little Honduran white bats. Like obviously those are cute ass bats, like cute fucking bat. But I think a big old bulldog bat, oh my God, so cute. One of my absolute favorite animals in the world is a hammerhead bat. Oh my God, they're so cute. They can be a little jarring at first, but I think that they are so fucking cute, especially because they love figs. Like that's their favorite food. You cannot like hate something that loves figs. Come on, he likes fit. He's just looking for a fig. I love the um, leaf nosed bats. Vampire bats are cute. I don't care. They're all wrinkly and shit. Fucking love them. The yellow shouldered bats are really cute. Those big eared bats. That's a cute bat. That's not even an ugly bat. I'm just like, oh my God, the long ears. I could die. <laughs> I'm having some really just uh, the, the, um, the cute rage is happening. The little fringe lipped bats. The white shouldered bat with the big teeth. Oh, I love the horseshoe bat with the big nose. The tube nosed fruit bat. He's got a weird nose. Love him. Would die for him. Oh, I just love ugly bats. And again, I don't mean ugly as in I think they're ugly. I mean like other people think that they're ugly. But I think that they're so irresistible. They're irresistible. There's a bat with a mohawk called a free-tailed bat. Oh, I just love the bats with the little thing on their nose. I love a wrinkly ass little bat. The visored bat, he's scary looking to you, but not to me. <laughs> I love bats. Uh, the uglier, the better. The wrinklier and the scarier, the better for me with a bat. I love them all. They're all my children. 
And there's just so much diversity. I love anything with diversity. That's why I love frogs so much too. There's fucking so many. Y'all, there are literally over 5,000 species of frogs for us to love. Can you believe it? And I will say, I am so shocked and delighted. Like I have no words, honestly. Like I just have no words to describe how much it means to me to see that frogs are like so popular now. It's amazing to me. And I will never stand here and say like, oh, I liked them before they were popular. Like I could die a happy person tomorrow. I'm not gonna die, I'm manifesting it right now. I hate when I say shit like that because it just freaks me out. But like, I am so happy that people love frogs right now. I'm so happy because I swear to God, like I remember just a couple of years, like five years ago, nobody really cared about frog. Frogs just like weren't like in. You know, and um, like I used to work as a vet tech and I would volunteer at the Amphibian Foundation before they could afford to pay me. And so whenever like I would tell people I work with, I'd be like, yeah, I work with frogs and stuff. And that's like what I want to do. They were like so confused. They're like, frogs? What? Why? Like frogs are gross. Like they thought frogs were gross back then, you guys. Like five years ago, people like the general person the lay person thought frogs were gross and stuff. Like I've met people that were terrified of frogs and stuff and just didn't care about them. And then all of a sudden, like I started seeing like people like loving frogs. And now that's all I see. Like frogs are like the thing right now. It makes me so happy. It makes me so happy. Please just keep loving frogs and snakes too. My God, when I first started working with snakes, I mean, oh my God, I would go out there and like try my best every day. Like every weekend I was out there like doing um, events and trying to get people to just like stop killing snakes. Like, if you could just at least stop murdering them, that'd be great. I was never like expecting people to like them. It was just like, can you please just understand that they are important and we just want you to stop murdering them. And like, even that was a hard sell. And now it's like, I don't know, now people really love snakes. I mean, not everybody likes snakes. Snakes are always gonna be difficult for some people, which I, I understand that there's like a fear, but, um, but people nowadays more than I ever, 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 ever thought was possible um love snakes and i just think that's amazing i just love to see it <laughs> it's amazing because that's really so important like we can do all of the research i can breed all of the endangered frogs and we can do all this stuff but without funding and then inevitably without just people caring nothing's gonna happen for these animals like everybody needs to care and i'm not saying that everybody needs to go out of their way and do all this crazy stuff but like people need to, you know, at the very least know about it and care. And I'm um, just seeing more of that than ever, ever, ever before, uh, That more than I ever thought was possible. And it is amazing. And so I see a lot of that for bats too. And so it's really cool. I just love to share that kind of stuff with everybody. I'm not the type of person that's like, well, I liked bats and frogs before they were cool. Like, dude, I'm so happy that they're cool. I'm so fucking happy that they're cool. I really am. Because if you really love something, you want to share it. You want it to be loved by everybody else, you know? And I'm just happy to see it. I really am. Snack asked, can you talk more about your experiences working with animal actors? Do you have any especially crazy stories or people to call out for being bad with animals? It's a great question because one of the coolest things I've gotten to uh, participate in is just being on sets with animals. I have a really good friend who is a animal casting agent and she goes to sets with them and stuff and she's really cool. Uh, her company is called uh, Universal Animals so definitely look them up because it's just really cool. They, they do a lot of sharing of like their animals on set and I love working with her and her dad because they are truly people who care so deeply about animals. You know, like they're a much smaller company and they just, you know, put the animals first and always make sure that everything, like they're just advocates for animals on set, which is, which is awesome. And so I first met them because, um, you know, I have a lot of connections in the area and like the local like reptile community. And one of my best friends called me and was like, hey, so I met these people and they're actually like casting agents for animals and they are looking for an American bullfrog for a movie and you are the only person I know who has one and so now if I haven't already I need to take a moment to tell you about the, the frog in question because he was without a doubt m the most special herp and herp being reptile and amphibian you know I love all my herps but he was the most special herp I've ever kept in my life. He meant the world to me. I'm gonna try not to even cry because he did pass away uh, two years ago. But he truly was 
the most amazing person I've ever known, and he was a, a bullfrog. <laughs> I've j I just loved him so much, and he was just an amazing frog. His name was Kikuman, and everything about him was, he was just one of those animals that was different. You know how you have like a really smart cat that acts like a dog or like a really smart dog that can like fold laundry and shit and paint flowers apparently. Have you seen that dog on TikTok painting flowers and shit? Amazing. Anyway, this frog was a lot like that where he was just a lot smarter, a lot more aware, a lot more personable. Uh, American bullfrogs in particular are not often kept as pets because they're really flighty. They're really fearful. Um, they just don't really want to be pets a lot of the time. Um, and for good reason, you know, American bullfrogs are not like bred by breeders in the pet trade. And, and that's the only circumstance in which they should ever be like kept as a pet is if you get them from a breeder or you rescue them, which I will, you know, end up telling you about my Kikuman. But obviously if you're taking a bullfrog out of the wild, like even though they're not in danger, like just don't take animals out of the wild. Uh, but if you ever have tried to catch a bullfrog before, you know that like they're really, they, uh, they're really flighty and they just don't like to be held or handled. And I try not to handle like mo most of my animals very frequently because they just, you know, I don't want to freak them out. I like to have, let them do their own thing. Um, and occasionally we'll hang out. But with Kikuman, he, he was just so different. Like he, he, he loved us. I think that he, as, as much as a frog could ever love a person, that was me and Kikuman. Like he would put his hands up on his tank and stare at me from across the room. And I've just never, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of frogs in my life. And I have never, ever, ever experienced like the level of like, awareness and like true bond and like he was just the smartest most fantastic frog i've ever known he loved queen the band specifically well we will rock you you're a boy make a big noise playing in the streets gonna be a big man someday you got mud on your face he loved queen it was his favorite band <laughs> He was just a character. I just like, you know, he would, he would take food right out of your fingers and he, you know, he didn't try to like get away from you like other bullfrogs. He would just sit right in your hands. Perfect candidate for, uh, for an acting gig. And they needed a bullfrog. And the reason that I was the only person who had a bullfrog <laughs> as a pet was because, um, again, bullfrogs don't make great pets. And I went to a food market and they had bullfrogs. And I had never seen that in my life. And I had no idea that was a thing. And I kept, you know, frogs and stuff. And so just my heart broke and I was like, I need, I need to take one. Now, if you ever see bullfrogs in a food market and you want to save one, do not release it into the wild. I'm actually begging you because they are riddled with chytrid and all different types of diseases. I had to quarantine Kikuman and just treat him for chytrid and all different types of things. They come from these big, dirty frog farms that pump out frogs. They actually make them grow up way too fast and it exponentially decreases their lifespan, which is really sad. That's why Kikuman only lived about six years when a bullfrog in the wild can live like 20 years. And six years is actually really long for a farm bred bullfrog because normally bullfrogs in the wild, uh, it takes them two years to go through metamorphosis. They are a tadpole for sometimes up to two years. And so that's a slow, gradual growth. But in the farms, you know, they like they grow them up really fast by means of like, you know, hormones and all different types of stuff. And that uh, affects their lifespan, unfortunately, because they don't need them to live long. You know, they just need them to to be able to be sold for food. And so never, ever, ever, ever buy any type of animal from a market, whether it's a bullfrog or a turtle or a lobster or anything and release it into the wild. It's just not the right thing to do. I know you think you're, it's your, your intentions are beautiful. They're golden. But when you introduce any animal from a market into the wild they are t they are riddled with diseases they oftentimes they won't make it either because they are not they are either aren't from the wild or if they're like a lobster like they're not even from that location like if you just put it right back into the ocean lobsters are from way 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 deep down in the ocean and they can't survive like really close to the surface for like northern lobsters like they they, they need really cold water and they live pretty deep down so it's just it, they don't survive so it's just it's not it's not the right thing to do, even though people I know think that it is. It's really not. It's really sad to see them. You want to save them all. I certainly wanted to save every single frog in that market, but I knew that I was kind of being irresponsible even taking the one because I was bringing them into my home where, you know, I have other pets 
And I knew I was going to have to be really careful about quarantining him in a different room and tra treating him for all these diseases. And I did it anyway because I felt really bad. So I was kind of impulsive in, in the sense that I knew I could probably care for a frog, especially a frog that's kind of hard to care for compared to other like frogs that are normally kept as pets. Like, you know, I wouldn't say that, a, that an American bullfrog is like a an easy frog to care for. They're really big, so they require a lot of space. And they're just a difficult frog. But I was like, I just felt so bad and there was, I needed to do something. So I decided to take the frog that looked like they had kind of the most life in them because uh, I wanted it to be as 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 uh, healthy as possible, you know? So I watched the frogs and I tried to find one that was like really kicking and uh, trying to trying to get out of there. I decided to adopt this bullfrog. And to be completely honest with you, I thought he would maybe last like a week and he was he ended up just being a special special soul in every way he he did great he was healthy he was strong and he was full of of personality so anyway my friends knew that i had this bullfrog who was like super special and that no one else out there had a bullfrog so so she was like you gotta you know talk to these people they are looking for a bullfrog for a, for a tv show and I was like, yeah, no, that would be awesome. And so I was like, as long as like they are good people that aren't trying to exploit animals, like I've never worked on an animal set. And I was also like, I know that they might not want this. I don't know how it works, but I would want to be on set with him. And uh, as soon as I talked to them, they were like, oh yeah, no, of course, that's, we would prefer that. Like we would love for you to even, you know, if you, if you want to, you certainly don't have to, but we'd love to learn how to work more safely with reptiles and amphibians. We'd love to like just you know, shadow you and watch you, how you work with him. And we'll just, we'll basically just be there to facilitate it. But you will be the one who goes on set with him. You'll be the one that's managing him. We'll just be there because we get got you the, got you the opportunity basically. And like, they know us, but they were like, no, his safety matters above all else. If he doesn't like it, you guys can go home. Like we were never going to make him do anything. You know, we're going to make sure that they, uh, for his parts that, you know, they, they are really like good about like if the lighting's harming him, if this is harming him, if this is freaking him out. And thankfully, you know, Kikamon was really good about about stuff. Like he wasn't a fearful frog. So I knew that he wouldn't be stressed out by this. And if he ever was, you know, I would know too, because American bullfrogs are very uh, you know, they're they're just they are they don't hide their stress. That's the thing with animals, that they're they can't be fake. They can't fake things. Yeah, they can be really stoic. But um, especially like a, a frog or something, they have no reason to be stoic or fake something. I was like, yeah, we'll try it, absolutely. And they just seemed really nice and they seemed like they really cared about animals. So we went to the set and it was a show that he worked on. He was in like seven episodes. It was called Hap and Leonard. I had never heard of it before, but it's it's like a cute show. Um, and it's on Sundance. And he was like, actually the devil, <laughs> that was his role like the devil would like turn into a frog and watch them and stuff so he would be in like scenes like in the back he would just be like on a log or like he would just be watching them you know and that's all he really had to do sometimes he had to hop <laughs> and um like that's the thing like I, I had no idea what to expect when we first got there they were like the frog's here okay what does he need does he need anything at all like where does he want to stay like where's the most comfortable place for him blah 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 and we're just like oh we'll just hang out in our car you know because when you're on a set if you've ever been on a set you just wait and he gets paid he got paid for that and um he he they but they were like we have like a little stunt double for him and it was like a little frog that looked just like him and they were like if there's ever anything he doesn't want to do we'll just put that in there you know and then we'll edit him in like seriously if he doesn't want to do it this is his stunt double this is his stand in you know and they were just but they were really like everybody was so so excited to have an animal on set and that was the first time I ever experienced that and since then kikuman has been on a couple different things and then I've had some of my other animals on some shows, Kikamon was also in Doom Squad, which is a like DC show. He was in that show and they were amazing. And then um, I had a bunch of my reptiles, a bunch of my snakes and uh, my tegu. They were in this show called, uh, why am I blanking out? Uh, MacGyver. And it's like a new MacGyver. I didn't even know that was a thing, but that was so fun too. And I got to work with, like directly with um, two of the cast members, which I'll tell you about in a little bit because I was just like crazy cool. But anyway, every time we went on set, not only did, again, the people from Universal Animals who have become some of my really good friends, they are, they go above and beyond. They, they are like such good advocates for the animals. They make sure that they're always comfortable, that they're, they're getting everything they want um, and more, you know, they're like, we can demand 
anything for these animals. Like we, they will bend over backwards. Like they're really good to animals on, on movie sets, like so good. And every time they get there, you know, people don't crowd the animals, but they're like, oh, the animals are here. I've never seen one person. Even when we had snakes, like everybody on set was like, oh, like even people who were afraid of the snakes were like, oh, but they never said anything mean. They were just like, oh, wow, the snakes have a job. That's crazy. Just keep them over there. Like if they were scared of the snakes, but most people on sets, like we'd have the directors and like these really important people that like look really scary, but then they'd be like, can I hold your snake? It was like the, the fastest way to get like right in there with all the with all the actors and like the producers and everybody who was like super important that, that they'll never talk to you otherwise, but they would like come right up to us and be like, can we pay your snakes? Like, that's so cool. And they're so nice. Like they're always like, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. We're really glad to be able to have some like live animals on our set. And if there's anything we can do to keep you and the animals comfortable, like let us know. Um, so they really treat you like if you when you have the animals, especially. Um, and I don't I know that it's not like this for everyone on like a movie set or on like a TV show set. But like for the animals, at least everything that I've experienced, they truly do treat you like you are like a, a huge part of the cast because they are you know the animals are a really important part of what they're doing and of their vision and they know that like you know a lot of the time they they would much rather have a real animal than have like a digitally you know altered animal and I know sometimes that's like that's necessary and that's probably for the best if it's like certain animals that that shouldn't be on set that are just too stressed out or like they're you know super wild animals and they just don't want to be on set. Um, I totally get that. But like for animals like mine who are totally used to people and they were doing the exact same thing they do when they go out to outreach events with kids and like if anything, it was one of the least stressful situations for them because they're all like education animals. Um, so they've been to places like the local museum and schools and camps and all different types of places. Um, and they've interacted with people. So they're used to stuff like that. And uh, if anything, it was a much more comfortable experience. And they're only ever like on camera for like five minutes, if that. Like they have very minimal roles. And so uh, I just found it to be like such an amazing experience. It was so rewarding. And it was good to know that, and I know this probably isn't the case on every set, but for the sets that I was on, people put these animals care and safety first. And again, they are all just so excited and so nice and so just like, you know, the animals are here. Yay, our star. Like they called Keek. Oh, my God. Everybody on the set of Happen Leonard and Doom Squad were so nice to Keek on. They loved him so much because um, on Happen Leonard, uh, Keek on was like one of the stars. Like he was he was in it for like seven. I think he was in almost every episode of that season. It was like season three or something. He was in almost every episode. And uh, he was he was like their star. They all loved him so much. Like the the two main actors who were in the show, um, and I think they're pretty big actors, uh, but I don't know them by name. But they were both so nice, and so they loved Kikomon. They were always like, "Can I pet him?" Like, "Yay, there's Kikomon!" Everybody knew his name. They loved him, um, and they were just so nice. And then the best experience I ever had on set was on MacGyver when I had a bunch of my snakes and stuff. Um, that was a show that had, uh, there's two actors in particular. I'm sure it's fine to talk about this stuff. They were so great and wonderful. So it's nothing but good things. But I forget this guy's name, even though he's, he was in the Hannah Montana movie. He was one of the nicest people I've literally ever met in my life. Not, not just like as an actor, he was so nice. And I guess it makes them a little nicer when you know that they could easily be like ignoring your existence. Is it Lucas Till? I want to think it's Lucas Till. That's his name. Yes, Lucas Till. He's in like this show MacGyver and he's he was in like, I, re I recognized him from the Hannah Montana movie and he's also in the Taylor Swift music video, You Belong With Me. <laughs> um, but he was there and he's like the star of the show. So I was like, oh, there, there's the star. Like he's probably too good for us, you know? But he was so nice. He was hanging, because I was on that set for like a couple days. He would like find us and hang out with us because we were like a group, like it was me and two of my other friends who were handling all the reptiles because there was kind of a lot. And he would like find us and come hang out with us. and be like, hey, what's up guys? Like, he, cause he really, he was like really interested in the animals and really, uh, really loved them. 
And so the first time I met him and got to talking with him, I was teaching him how to handle the snake because he was going to have to do that. He was so concerned about like, you know, there's probably other actors out there who are just like, Ugh, like let's get this over with. Like, Ugh. but he was like, how do I do this in the best way? Like, that's not going to scare him. And like, does this hurt him and blah, blah, blah. And there was one other person that was in this episode that I got to teach how to handle snakes. <laughs> And I'm like fangirling right now because I, that's the thing, you cannot fangirl on set, of course. You know, I was like in, in my, like on the outside, I was like, I've never seen this woman in my life. I don't know who, who you are. But on the inside, I was freaking out. It was fucking Allie from Allie and AJ. She was in the episode. <laughs> and so she was all, and she was in the scene too. So I had to teach her how to hold and handle a snake too. I'm actually really taking this very well. So, I mean, Do I don't you, think- Do you want to try? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and she was so nice and so nice to the animals like that both of them that's something like if you want to get right into my heart be nice to animals care about animals like you know everybody that's what i love to see is like everybody is like oh there's animals this is amazing and they're so nice and i've, I've never had anything but like a fantastic experience um you know they let they obviously like were totally allowed to like pig out on all the amazing craft services all day even though he was only in seven episodes there were so many scenes and they were all filmed in different places so like it was matt was taking him to set sometimes we had to take keep him on to work like we'd just be like who's taking keep him on to work tonight like we'd have to go two hours one place one hour another place and then we'd have to be there for like sometimes up to like 12 hours um, the, the quickest time, I think it was like maybe four hours and then it's, it's a lot, but there's like tons of food. They get it all catered. Everybody's really nice, at least to us. Everybody was super, super nice. And it's been an amazing experience. And I don't know, again, I can't speak for all of, all of the sets and I can't say that every single film set ever has always been that wonderful to animals, but I always, I, I just, I'm happy that I have like a friend. I have these friends who work for Universal Animals that I always can trust and I know that like anything that they're working on, they are doing right by the animals and they're doing a great job advocating for the animals, protecting them. And it's it made me feel a lot better knowing that like a lot of these sets, you know, even if you have like people who don't care as much as, you know, universal animals or whatever, you have people who like the directors and the actors a lot of the time. And again, can't speak for all of them. I haven't done that much. But most of the time, it seems like they are really excited and happy and just they see that my favorite thing, I know that I've gone forever on this question, it's fine. My favorite thing by far is that they see the animals as their co-stars, as actors. It's my favorite thing. Like I always thought they were just going to be like, oh yeah, bring the animals in. We got to do this. We got to get it done. But they treat them just like any other actor. They they say, do, you, do they need anything? Is there anything they need? Like, you know, anything at all. They If you told them, Kikamon needs some bugs, you need to run down to Petco or like if it's in the middle of the night, you need to go out there and catch some bugs with your hands. Like they would probably have somebody do it because they're just like anything that they're an actor. They are the talent <laughs> they need, you know, and it's just really cool to see that they kind of regard animals as these sentient beings instead of just props. That was what I was most worried about is that like, I was like, my animal is not a prop. So if there's something that like, but they are so good. They're just like anything that he doesn't want to do, we'll write it a different way, you know? And I love that. So I've ho I've always had really good experiences, and uh, and yeah, my f I, I I'm happy to have like you know um, friends in the industry that they come to me whenever they know I have something or know someone who needs it. I just had my other frog. Uh, I wasn't on set with her. I I just because I trust her 100 percent now. So I just she'll come and pick up animals sometimes and bring them to set. But I had my frog Hudson was in like a Nickelodeon movie of some sort and he is so cute I wish I could show you the picture but he's in like an outfit that they made sure was frog safe and everything and it's really cute so I'll let you know like when I find out more about that what he's gonna be in but yeah uh there's only so long this video can be I will certainly be giving you know a tour anybody who comes to the wedding will get to see it and then during the wedding video, we'll give you a grand tour of the island. But I appreciate you guys sticking around and hearing me blab about whatever. And um, I will see you in the next one. I'll see you at the wedding if you'll be there this weekend. And if not, um, I do have a lot of videos planned. It's been pretty busy for me, but I should be able to start making more videos more frequently soon. That's really what I want to do. I have so many ideas. I know I need to do another story of seasons because... <laughs> 
not only has a lot happened, but I know that there's a lot that needs to happen that I've been putting off. I have more Stardew I want to do. Um, I would love to play The Sims. I have some videos like of my face talking that I want to do. So, you know, uh, just stay tuned and, and yeah, hopefully I'll see you in the next one.